Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. The whole world might be closed, Jim. We're still here serving the Three Martini Lunch. There's a few more seats probably than usual available in the bar, so grab a stool and join us. Isn't it nice that at least people can count on something and that their Three Martini Lunch is still here? Yeah, although, Greg, I'm now realizing, if everyone's supposed to, like, bump elbows or something instead of handshaking, how dangerous do our elbows become? (laughs) Yeah, then you cough into your elbow. That can be a problem, right? So uh, I was thinking about this yesterday, Jim, and for those who listened to us on Thursday, you know that pretty much every couple of minutes, Jim was saying, hey, this got canceled. Hey, this got suspended. (laughs) On and on and on. And so uh, a very incomplete list of the things that got uh, scratched yesterday March Madness, sadly, for the men and the women, as well as all winter and spring sports for the NCAA. They're just taking the rest of the year off because so many colleges and universities are taking indefinite leaves here, at least for on-campus activities. Uh, Delay in the beginning of the Major League Baseball season. Spring training canceled, at least a two-week delay in the start of the regular season. The National Hockey League suspending its season. We already talked about the NBA yesterday. Uh, The PGA Tour suspended today. And another gut punch to me personally and many other people i'm sure the masters has been postponed disneyland is closed uh states are now closing schools for weeks on end although virginia is not quite there yet so uh jim while people debate whether this is uh, appropriate or an overreaction in some of these cases for example i think golf with no spectators would probably be fairly safe uh nonetheless this is where we are and i feel like everyone yesterday was channeling walt and you say who's walt Walt's the power guy when the FBI wrongly forced uh, the power company to cut off power to Nakatomi Plaza when terrorists took it out. And here was Walt's call to downtown. I got a big problem down here. Shut it down. Shut it down now. So shut it down was pretty much the mantra of the day yesterday, Jim. And uh, hopefully this shutting it down is more effective than shutting it down was in Die Hard. Yeah, yeah. I just kind of wish we could throw the coronavirus off a building. You know, one one other thing they got, you know, look, if chances are whatever you've got going on in life for the rest of spring and maybe into early summer, it's probably canceled. One other thing kind of throw onto that list, the National Rifle Association said that their annual meeting will not be uh, occurring in Nashville this year. Uh, usually I go and cover those, kind of bummed. But, you know, it's one of those things where, like by Monday you would have said, oh, my God, there's no way they're going to do that. And by the time it was announced last night, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. As we get into our martinis today, Jim, we actually have a good martini. We only even have a good martini with a good chaser. So uh, we still have bad and crazy, and the bad's really bad, and the crazy's pretty crazy. But uh, let's get into the good here, because as you lead off in the morning jolt here on Friday, we have progress on testing. And this is good in two different ways. As you point out, uh, Roach Holding AG, the Swiss pharmaceutical, uh, is working on two different versions of a coronavirus test, which they hope to be in a position to test thousands of patients a day. Uh, the Mayo Clinic is working on this. The University City of Washington, Amazon. Yes, Amazon has its own healthcare system. So that's a whole other discussion for another day. But they're working on this as well. The Cleveland Clinic is uh, putting together tests. And a lot of these tests are getting results much faster than the existing tests, which are also in way too short of supply. Now, Jim, in some of these cases, uh, these institutions perhaps get money from the federal government. So there's perhaps kind of a public-private partnership here. But this idea, in addition to the fact that more people can be tested and have results soon, it shows that the private sector is vital in situations like this because the government is way too clunky to be able to pivot and do this on short notice. Yeah. You know, I think one of the lessons of this is that the American healthcare system is full of lots of smart people, some in the private sector, some in pharmaceutical companies and diagnostic companies and things like that, some in the public sector, some in uh, universities and you know, when they all mobilize and, and start, you know, uh, pull, rowing in the same direction, so to speak, they can do some amazing things. Now, people in, in our world very often will say, oh, my goodness, you know, what's wrong with these idiots in government? Why can't they get anything right? Well, you know, look, I, I you know, having written the weed agency, I will be among the very first in line when it comes to criticizing, denouncing and mocking the federal bureaucracy. But when you have a situation like this, the government is only trying to balance something between, OK, we want to have, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, so to speak. We want to have everybody going off and being free to experiment in their own way and come up with their own methods for testing for the coronavirus. But at the same time, you want standardization, right? You don't want to make sure that somebody develops a test and it's 
defective or, or, you know, it's more invasive than the other ones or it has more false positives or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you want to have a certain amount of standardization, but you also want to leave people free enough to come up with new ideas and try new things and see if it's effective. Um, the Mayo Clinic, I believe they work theirs out in a matter of like eight hours or something like that. You know, they, we've once you tell people, hey, this is a serious crisis and we need this fixed ASAP, they can really come up with some brilliant ideas and figure some stuff out. You're talking about the Mayo Clinic and various other institutions basically creating drive throughs where you don't have to go into the institution and hopefully you're not coughing on anyone and, and all that kind of stuff. You go in, you, I don't know if there's, some of them are talking about nasal samples. I don't know what some of them might be cheek swabs or something like that. Um, you go in, you get your sample, you test it, and they can get the results in a matter of, uh, of, day, of hours instead of days. So the good news is we have really good people. And once government can you know, say, okay, guys, you're free, experiment the way you need to, things can go right. It is frustrating that the CDC apparently did not recognize how much we were going to need a lot more tests a lot more quickly and that we needed to give people a little more leeway in how they were going to uh, develop the testing methods and things like that. We are things are moving in the right direction on this. We can have a discussion. And in fact, my guess is we probably will have a very angry discussion about why we were not prepared, what kind of steps were necessary, who was slow in approving this sort of thing. Let, you know, we can have that conversation and we should have the conversation. Let's focus on beating the coronavirus now and then we can get to the finger pointing. Speaking of the private sector, Jim, this one's on a micro scale, but it certainly made me smile. This is from USA Today. As coronavirus panic reaches a fever pitch and the World Health Organization calls it a pandemic, some people have taken advantage of people's anxiety for a quick buck. This is not gouging, trust me. This includes one teenager in the United Kingdom who was sent home from school for the day for selling squirts of hand sanitizer to his friends at Dixon's Unity Academy in Leeds. Jenny Tompkins posted her son's money-making schemes on Facebook Wednesday, where it amassed nearly 198,000 reactions and 98,000 comments, much of which praised his entrepreneurial savvy. On Facebook, Tompkins herself wrote, quote, Very hard to discipline this behavior when his dad phones him from work to call him a bleeping legend. And so <laughs> he, he made a grand total of $11 here, Jim, which he used to buy a bag of Doritos and hopes to be able to afford a kebab with the rest of his earnings. So uh, we love that entrepreneurial spirit. I see a spot on Shark Tank for him down the line here. I was going to say that, you know, there was that gif of uh, Will Ferrell saying, I'm not even mad. I'm so impressed. Uh, that's that's kind of where you are. You're like, OK, yeah. look, he discovered a need in the marketplace and he met it. So yeah. that's exactly how it works. He sold each squirt for 64 cents, though. I wouldn't want to deal with that many pennies. I would just round to 65. That does seem rather or... precise. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of uh, overhead. I don't know if he had to hire someone then to uh, make the change while he was let's delivering note, the squirts. Let's assume that every kid who experienced this, by the next day, like after school, they're like, well, I'm going to the store. i got to find some Purell. <laughs> and then there's competition in the market, and that brings prices down. Exactly. Somebody's going to be doing it for 50 cents by the end of the week. So. Mine's only a quarter. All right. Well, we've spent a lot of time here talking about the beauty of the private market and the decisions that can be made there. This is going to seem slightly schizophrenic, but let's move to our bad martini now, Jim, because China is not playing nice here. Uh, in the state-run, read that, communist media agency, uh, they're now saying that the U.S. owes China an apology, that China was uh, did a great job in handling the coronavirus while it, well, the outbreak was happening there. Uh, you also have Chinese state officials blaming the U.S. Army for launching the virus in China, when, as you point out today, it happened in these uh, open-air markets over there, which, which is why most of these epidemics uh, launch over there. But Marco Rubio has a, a different take on this because the Chinese are now threatening to withhold vital medications uh, to the U.S. population at a very critical time. And that's because the U.S. has farmed out production of a lot of different components of this stuff to China. Here's what Rubio said on Fox and Friends. Their official newspaper, the Communist Party, wrote an op-ed basically mocking the United States, saying you should be thanking us, you should be apologizing to us. If we cut you off from your drugs, uh, you guys would fall off the cliff and go into some inferno. I forgot the language they use now. They actually specifically singled out Florida as part of it. Um, so what it tells you is that they realize that in a moment of crisis, let's say the U.S. and China have a showdown over something, and they can threaten to cut us off of our 
pharmaceutical supplies, they could trigger a domestic problem here that would make it difficult for us to confront them. It's a tremendous amount of leverage. So we need to invest and make available investments and mm -hmm. flow investments into rebuilding that capacity in places where we have critical shortages, not just pharmaceuticals, but rare earth minerals all across the right. board. It's good jobs for Americans, and it's good for our national security and economic security. So, Jim, on the one hand, you want companies to be able to pursue the, the line of business that works best for them and for cheaper production. A lot of people obviously have gone overseas. Uh, the, the, obviously, manufacturing in the United States has been a big issue uh, politically for a long time and economically as well. It's certainly a major reason that Trump did well in 2016. And so reliance on China and obviously trying to save some money on production has a price. And, and we're seeing that now. And I think it's going to be interesting to see once we're past this, what the approach is going to be. Are we going to look for more of a domestic base to do all this stuff so we're able to respond more deftly in a crisis? Yeah, it's been interesting because in the last day or two, I've seen some pushback from more libertarian minded folks uh, who I generally respect and agree with a lot of the time who are, who are basically saying, uh, variations of, well, look, you know, is, is this really the time where we want to argue with China and say, you know, in the middle of a crisis like this, do we want to, you know, jab into them? Do we want to basically, you know, make it tougher to get, you know, imported medications from China? I, I think at this point, they're, they're being a little naive and not looking at, you know, China's behavior holistically. Um, you know, it's also worth noting that various Chinese foreign ministry spokesmen basically have now started openly, you know, speculating or claiming that the coronavirus is some sort of U.S. military bioweapon that it was released on their territory or something like that. From the beginning of this, there's been speculations either that this was some sort of escaped bioweapon from the Chinese or, or some other factor like that. Um, I don't think I, I'm rather skeptical of that simply because if you go back, you can find people saying that the open air markets that they were you know, using in China were probably exactly the kind of circumstance that a virus like this would spread from some other species to humans. So I don't think you really would necessarily need this to be a bioweapon. But that having been said, how many times does your trading partner have to punch you in the face and threaten to stab you in the heart for you to say, you know what, I just don't want to trade with you anymore. We cannot trust. Now, notice we're not having these problems. And nobody's saying, you know, the United States must make all medications for all of its citizens and we cannot import any drugs from anywhere. We don't have these problems with the United Kingdom. We don't have these problems with France and Germany and Japan and South Korea. We have these problems with China, right? And the way they, and the way they're handling the world, the way they interact with us. So, to me, this is this is turning more and more into a no-brainer. Another conversation that you know, the details of it may have to wait until things kind of calm down. But at that point, I think it's pretty clear we have to reevaluate almost every aspect of our interaction with China that relates to public health, national security, um, technology, the stuff you see with Huawei and five G and all that stuff. At this point, there's just interacting with China in a way that makes us dependent upon them simply is not worth the risk. This is one of the things I think that could potentially be a positive out of this. Uh, hopefully the, the damage to the health of Americans is as minimal as possible here, and we'll see how that plays out, obviously, over the next few weeks. But uh, realizing that China is essentially evil here, not only are they communists, but they're essentially saying, oh, oh, oh guess what would happen if we don't give you the drugs that you need? I mean, that's pretty twisted uh, coming from the government. Uh, there's a couple other ways I think that uh, our society might actually uh, be improved as a result of this. Number one, uh, sick people being shunned back into seclusion. Uh, they call it self-quarantining uh, now. It used to just be staying home so you don't get other people sick. That could be better. And uh, online learning. Uh, we'll see how this goes with the colleges and universities, but it's generally cheaper because there's no room and board when people do it that way now. And uh, we'll see if that leads to a major shift in how higher education is done. When we come through the end of this, which, by the way, like I'm hoping a month from now things look better. I'm hearing some people say, you know, it may not peak until May. Depends on temperatures rising. Depends on how effective this self-quarantining is and things like that. Um, things should get better by summer, but I'm also hearing health experts say that a second, it may be seasonal. Uh, a second wave in fall is definitely a possibility. We may be dealing with this for a considerable time. In light of that, it'll be very interesting to see what from this quarantine experience we decide to keep and which we decide to, you know, I think, I, first of all, the nice thing will be that when, when it becomes a little bit safer to interact with people, I think you'll see the restaurants filled. I think you'll see the bars filled. Uh, I think attendance at all sporting events will be off the charts. I think everyone will be very eager to go out and interact with each other once it is safe again. 
Uh, it's just a question of how long that is. And I think that there'll be, you know, like that'll all be terrific for the economy. We just got to, you know, get through this hard part to get to that boom at the end. All right, let's move to our crazy martini now, Jim. And uh, Congress is debating on what type of monetary assistance and different programs is going to help uh, America get through this time of uh, economic disruption and health disruption, potentially. And so they're trying to put together legislation that will address these things, uh, paid sick leave and all, all sorts of other things. But one of the reasons it didn't happen yesterday, it looks like it might happen today in the House, but one of the reasons it didn't happen Thursday, poison pills, and one in particular. This is the Daily Caller. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi sought to include a potential way to guarantee federal funding for abortion into the coronavirus economic stimulus plan, according to multiple senior White House officials. Those officials allege that while negotiating the stimulus with U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, Pelosi tried to lobby for several provisions that stalled bipartisan commitment to the effort. One was a mandate for up to a billion dollars to reimburse laboratory claims, which White House officials say would set a precedent of health spending without protections outlined in the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment blocks clinics that perform abortions from receiving federal funding, and Democrats have pushed the Trump administration to end it since he was elected. Quote, a new mandatory funding stream that does not have Hyde protections would be unprecedented, one White House official explained. Under the guise of protecting people, Speaker Pelosi is working to make sure taxpayer dollars are spent covering abortion, which is not only backwards but goes against historic norms. A second White House official referred to the provision as a slush fund, and yet another question what the Hyde Amendment and abortion have to do with protecting Americans from coronavirus. So, Jim, as a lot of folks like to say, watch what they spend money on during a crisis, because a lot of folks think it's a Christmas tree and not just the crisis at hand. Yeah, Greg, I was thinking about this. I think probably one of the most honest and also damaging statements in recent decades in Washington came in, I think it was you know very early in the Obama administration when Rahm Emanuel, then the White House Chief of Staff, said, never waste a crisis. Um, for a long time, years after that, my joke was, he, he actually meant to say never solve a crisis. Uh, particularly with the United States, as you know, with the slow pace of the recovery from the recession, the emphasis of green shoots, the stimulus is working. Uh, all the problems they had with Obamacare, uh, the Deepwater Horizon, you know, uh, there was a long stretch where it looked like the Obama administration was not great at this. And I think part of the problem is, and I think, I don't know how you undo this in our political system, but, you know, what is the number of lawmakers who look at something like this and say, ooh, something bad has happened. We're going to need to pass something to deal with this. Therefore, I can get what I want and I can attach it into these, you know, sure, what I want, whether it's abortion funding or a pork project for my district or something like that, you know, I can get that into the bill. And because, you know, because you got to pass the bill, anybody who says, well, look, you know, what you know, this is the Support Puppies Act of, you know, 2020. How can you oppose <laughs> the Support Puppies Act? Now, of course, you know, one part of the bill is to support puppies and the other part is to, you know, build a new name it after Robert Byrd Center in West Virginia or something like that. We've seen this game for so long. It is deeply disturbing that people cannot put aside this instinct, even when we're facing a crisis of this magnitude. And I think they're pushing back on this, uh, but I don't know. I, I, and it's one of those things where you become a, a, it becomes a question of, does the public pressure to get something passed get the people who think this stuff shouldn't be in the bill? Does it create enough pressure on them to say, ah, oh, this is another week, we can't have this fight today. We look like we're opposing the overall bill. It looks like we look like we're trying to hold up needed assistance to people who are suffering from coronavirus. We got to let this pass. This should not be a mystery. The bill should be out there for everybody to see, and people should be free to ask, say, hey, this does not belong in a, in a coronavirus bill. We can argue that on a different time and a different bill. We need to be focusing on this. We are, you know, this, this is just not the time and the place for it. It's amazing to see all kinds of Americans, you know, all across the country who are now figuring out how can we get meals to people who are shut in, who are self-quarantining. U-Haul is giving uh, college students 30 days free storage if they've been kicked out here. We have so many people who are trying to help this country. And then you see people who are basically saying, how can I profit from this? What, what, what's in it for me? And they're really, they're just one step above the coronavirus scammers who are already putting stuff on social media and calling people and stuff like that. Jim, it's Friday. We made it. Considering where we were a week ago, it's uh, hard to know exactly what we'll be dealing with next week. But enjoy the weekend. Lord willing, we'll reconvene on Monday. Indeed, Greg. I just want to point out for all of our listeners, yes, it is a little bit ominous to hear people saying that fatigue can be one of the signs of coronavirus. 
Let's also point out fatigue can be one of the signs you've been just been hearing about coronavirus all week. <laughs> this week has been a very long year, everyone. I hope you're doing okay. And yes, you'll hear from us again on Monday. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a kind review. Also, those home devices, since you're going to be at home, that plays the podcast too. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Do have a great weekend and please join us again Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.